First, I want to apologize um, to the chairs for being late for the first talk. I was stuck in, in the um, foundation, and Barbara Bercy gave, her, uh, gave a presentation at the end. It was so emotional, I just couldn't get up and on time. It was just impossible. So anyhow, so you're, just to recapitulate the most important thing, when Bovey invented his machine that worked for the first time for an electrosurgical instrument, he had a small little metal tip like this. That's how I grew up, and most of us with gray hair in this room, but who uses MIS? Who does MIS surgery in the room? Raise your hand. Everybody, right? So now we're talking about this because we're not working with a little tip like this. We're working with antennas, okay, with lightsabers. And the entire shaft of what you work with is actually an active electrode. When you operate MIS, you only, you only look for that tip. You don't pay attention to the rest of that shaft. And that's what gets you in trouble because 300,000 hertz radio frequency ablation, it is not called radio frequency ablation for no reason. You are emitting a radio electromagnetic field when you activate an antenna. So the moment you activate your insulator shaft where you're looking at the end at your bovi tip, the entire shaft is emitting electromagnetic energy. And what happens to the other shaft that you're holding the duodenum? It acts as a receiver. So, in, so we have the perfect storm in MIS surgery with electrosurgical energy. The way we use it since Bovi is that we are creating several active electrodes just by activating one. So that's why you're sitting here. That's why we talk about this, because 20 years ago, nobody thought about even talking about this because we didn't see the energy problem. So I'm going to talk about a very special case. There's only very few questions in the exam, and I'm going to try to be quick. How do I advance the slides on oh, this thing here? So I have nothing to disclose. So what's radio frequency ablation? We use the same current, 300,000 alternating, but we use special electrodes, and I explain why. So we are relying on the same tissue effect through ionic agitation. But here's the difference in the tissue effect. On the left side, you see a monopolar pencil, and you see what happens when you put that into the liver and you try to ablate a volume of tissue, what, what happens is that the insulation created around the tip prevents extension of heat. What we use in ablation is an antenna that's designed to give you a much greater volumetric tissue ablation or death. In addition, the machine is a computer that measures the delivered energy and adjusts the delivered energy to the amount of resistance to maximize the amount of energy deposited in the tissue. In other words, when the resistance in the tissue rises, it lowers the energy that is delivered to prolong as much as possible the deposition of energy. So that's the principle of radio frequency ablation. What does that mean? It means that we are delivering energy much, much longer to the tissue. The dwell time, you heard about that, is very long. 20 minutes, half an hour. We're delivering large amount of energy because the energy that we need to deliver to a blade five centimeter ball of liver tissue is 250 watts. Not 30, not 50, not 100, 250. So there's two and a half, 100 watt light bulbs burning in that liver for half an hour. And the anesthesiologist sees the temperature of the patient rise. That's how much energy we deposit in the tissues. So that current is much bigger. So what happens, we need much larger dispersive electrodes to prevent burns at the level of the skin. But even with those large electrodes, if you change the geometry of those electrodes, if 
the assistant or yourself are leaning with your elbow on one of these, on, on one of these dispersive electrodes, then you, you can deform the geometry in such a way that you can still burn the skin. Okay, so these are the problems that can occur with radiofrequency ablation. That's the ideal burn that we want. What you see here is the electrode schematically. This is the active burn, and then heat extension can happen, and this is a vessel. That would be ideal. The problem is that we have a, a, a thing that's called heat sink. The vessel that has constant blood flow in it takes away some of the heat. So what in reality what happens is we get very irregular ablations. Well, you see that? The vessel acts as a heat sink, just like this vessel here. And instead of having a round ablation, most ablations are irregular. Makes lots of sense, right? You're following me? So ablation is not the same as resection because we can get incomplete ablations and we can get incomplete death of the tumor. Therefore, it's mostly for palliative intent, for lesions that are surgically unresectable because of their location close to large vessels, or because they're unresectable because of metastatic disease, or because the patient is a poor surgical candidate. It is most often used as a bridge to transplant. For an average liver surgeon, a 10% portion of his practice is radiofrequency ablation if he does, if he uses more or less reasonable indications. So here's an example of a complication due to a um, biliovascular fistula. So this abscess is actually due to the fact that a bile duct was injured and a vessel were injured, and this had to be embolized. So these are some of the complications that you can see due to uh, injury to structures that are adjacent to the ablation. A couple of words on microwave ablation. The difference between radiofrequency ablation and microwave ablation is that microwaves works through agitation of water molecules, which are natural dipoles, as they are heated while the electromagnetic field is rotating. So instead of an electric field, alternating current, you have a electromagnetic field, the microwave field, and that's rotating. So that creates movement of ions and heat. And this is what it what it looks like when you uh, use special cameras to capture the electromagnetic field. So that's a microwave needle, and that is the volumetric distribution of the heat. And this is what an ablation zone looks like around a microwave needle. Now you can use chokes that prevent the energy to go up the needle, and then you can change the shape of your ablation zone. Most systems have this type of round ablation, and you get this type of ablation zone, and notice that microwaves or electromagnetic energy doesn't stop at anything. So you can ablate the vena cava, you can ablate the left or right or middle hepatic vein, you certainly can ablate all the bile ducts, you can ablate the diaphragm, you can ablate the stomach, the gallbladder, and the duodenum if you use this technology without understanding that it doesn't respect any boundaries in contrast to radiofrequency ablation. So it's a little bit more tricky to use that. That's pretty much all I have to say about the uh, energy. How much more time do I have? So since I have a little bit more time and that's all you really need to know, let me show you a couple of questions so we can go to that. Which of the following would be an indication for radiofrequency ablation in a kidney? A, tumor is contained with the, within the kidney and is not near any large vessels. 
B, tumor is metastatic. C, tumor is five centimeter in size. D, patient is an ideal surgical candidate. Which question, which answer is the right one? A, B, raise your hand. Who is for B? Who is for C? Who is for D? Okay, B is the right answer, right? We talked about this is, it's not an indication in a, in a case where the, um, um, no, it would be an indication, yeah. Tumor is metastatic is the right answer. Because if it's contained, it should be resected by surgery. If it's five centimeters in size, it's unlikely to be a complete ablation by radiofrequency. Therefore, surgery is indicated. And of course, if he's an ideal surgical candidate, it's inherent you use surgery. Remember that. What is the highest electrical energy delivered by current RFA systems? I mentioned that already. A, 150, B, 250, C, 350, D, 400. A, B, got it, 350 and 400 is wrong. Which of the following statements describes RFA versus electrosurgery and is correct? A, radiofrequency ablation may require multiple dispersive electrodes. B, Temperature monitoring of the dispersive electrode is critical when using electrosurgery, but less so in radiofrequency ablation. C, the patient is grounded in electrosurgery and the patient is not in radiofrequency ablation. Direct current is applied, uh, D, direct current is applied to tissue in RFA and alternating current is used in electrosurgery. Who is for A? Who is for any of the other ones? Thank you. See, we don't make it so difficult, so don't be afraid. You're going to pass the test. It's actually pretty straightforward. Once you understand the concept, which of the following is an undesirable result that can occur because of presence of a large blood vessel in a radiofrequency ablation procedure? A, unintended injury. B, overheating of the electrode. C, uneven delivery of the energy. And D, dispersive electrode burn. A, unintended injury. B, overheating of the electrode. C, C, thank you. Very good, you're fast learners. My, one of my uh, teachers always told me you're a fast learner but you have very short memory. Radiofrequency ablation is a subset of radiofrequency electrosurgery developed to destroy large volumes of tissue by which process? A, vaporization, B, coagulation, C, carbonization. Who is for A? Who is for B? Who is for C? You passed it. You want, okay, last, last one. Which statement is true about the wavelength of a microwave system? The wavelength of a microwave system increases proportional to the number of ablation antennas. B, the frequency of a microwave system is lower than that of an RFA system. C, the wavelength of a microwave system is much shorter than in an RFA system. D, the wavelength of a microwave system is much longer than in an RFA system. Now, I didn't show you the picture, but I told you that microwave is electromagnetic field. And I told you that, and we know that radio frequency ablation is about 300,000 hertz. Who, who knows the right answer? Who is for A? Who is for B? Who is for C? And who is for D? Okay, you can't, you can't really know the answer, but microwave, uh, the frequency of microwaves is several million hertz, okay? It's in the megahertz. So the, the wavelength of a microwave system is much shorter than in an RFA. So some of you guys had the right answer. I'm gonna stop here, otherwise you, you get the test 100% and then we have to readjust the test questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>